Hello members and welcome. Welcome everyone, just letting you in at our sharp 7 p.m. start. Um, welcome one and all, for those of you who I haven't met before, my name is Anna Spooner and I am a tastings and events coordinator at the Wine Society. Uh, I'm delighted, first of all, to have so many of you keen to join our sip size on Syrah tonight. In particular, uh, this one uh, is rather exciting because for those of you I haven't already told, I am currently in the Rhone, in the Southern Rhone to be exact. Uh, I'm actually at this very moment in the Boutonou offices due to, well, in the in the Boutonou house, I should say, in Kiran, um, because of a little bit of a dodgy internet problem at uh, my parents' home. However, um, the reason I mention it is that I am living and breathing the great variety Syrah at the moment. Um, it's what we've been harvesting alongside Grenache. It's what I've been doing my pump downs, uh, but sorry, my pump overs, my punch downs, uh, clearing out vats, you name it. I've been uh, doing it to Syrah these last couple of weeks. So uh, very excited to bring you three lovely Syrahs this evening, but also to tell you a bit about the story of the grape variety. Uh, so it's worth us beginning with a little bit of myth busting. Um, a lot of people say, oh, Shiraz, Syrah, um, is it due to the, the Persian or now Iranian city of the same name? Did the grape variety come from there? There's a rumor that uh, one of the Knights of the Crusade brought the vine to France, um, but that's just not true. Uh, lovely story, like, like some wonderful fables in wine, uh, just factually incorrect. Uh, so, so it's actually been DNA profiled or proven. They fingerprint these grapes, and in 1999, they've proved or pro pro proved uh, that Syrah is actually the child or offspring of two rather obscure grapes, and they're both from the southeast of France. So they're not from Persia. Uh, one is Dureza, uh, and the other is Montjuïc Blanche. So no relation to uh, Persia or modern day Iran at all. Um, some people say, well, why is it called Shiraz in Australia uh, and other parts of the world? We'll go on to that in a bit. Um, but it's just as likely that it was a, a language change uh, or a language hiccup uh, through accent and dialect. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the final wine on Aussie. Um, but one major thing as well is that Petit Syrah is not to be confused. It is not the same grape variety. Uh, Petit Syrah, spelt S-I-R-A-H, uh, is actually a cross of Syrah and Peloussin, which uh, dates back sort of 1800s, a long time ago. So it's definitely not baby Syrah, if you want to call it that. So where does it grow? Um, I'll give you a brief overview and then we'll talk about parts of the world where you can taste Syrah. Um, but essentially, Syrah is a Mediterranean grape variety. It uh, doesn't like things being too cold. So you'll notice that there's a sort of band um, around the world that Syrah can grow in. It doesn't like things too cold. It likes warm and moderate climates. Um, it's able to produce incredibly large yields. So you can get some quite basic wines from Syrah uh, if the yields are too high, but you can also get some of the finest and most expensive wines in the world. Um, it's also quite resistant to pests and diseases. So that does mean it's quite an attractive variety to grow. And we'll see on a couple of our wines that it's really on the up in those countries. Uh, but what does it taste and most importantly for me look like? Now, if you have any of the wines this evening, please do grab one, any, if you've got a syrup of your own. I'm going to talk about the flavour profile, the appearance, etc. I'm going to start with the Society's French Syrah. I will talk about it more in a moment, but just to give you a demonstration on the, on the appearance, on the structure, on the flavours, we'll kick off um, using that one. So if you do want to join me and you have it to hand, please do. But like I said, any syrup will do. So I believe we've got an image and the image is, oh, 
pardon me. It is me, I think on Monday, taking a sample from a Syrah tank or a Syrah barrel, I should say, a barrique. Um, and great fun to do. I've got to get my hand all the way down the cap uh, to take this particular sample to test the density and test how the fermentation is going. Uh, but you can pretty much guarantee that I will be washing all my arms uh, for Syrah. It stains my nails. Uh, it's really, really deep, very deeply coloured wine, or much deeper than Cabernet Sauvignon. So if you do get Syrah in your glass next to Cabernet made similarly, then you will find the Syrah tends to be um, more of a, of a, a, a more intense colour. The other thing is, and on the next slide you'll see, the type of colour. And it's very inky, and I didn't really realize how inky it was until I started working with it. We cleaned out this vat on Friday, maybe, and you can see that kind of almost, I don't want to say blue color, because it's not blue, but it's got that proper purple. And when you're comparing it next to Grenache that we're also working with, it really is that blue purple inky color. So if you're trying to spot a Syrah, those are two good uh, ways to spot it. Now, don't get me wrong, that color doesn't look like anything that ends up in your glass. That's actually the, the, the leaves and all the old bits and they take some of the color with it. So it's not going to end up exactly that color. But comparatively, working with the two grapes, it's a completely different ball game. Very, very intense. So let's go on to what it tastes like. Uh, there are some classic telltale signs of Syrah, and the main one really, but in particular for French Syrah, for me, but I think universally for a lot of people, if you can smell it, is black pepper right in the middle there. Um, we did do an amazing Aussie Shiraz mini masterclass with Freddie and Emma Symington MW, um, was it a week ago? Um, and I will send the link round to members because it's a great one to watch after this because it's particularly focusing on Australian styles. But um, she did say that there, there are certain people who can't smell black pepper. They are agnostic. It's not agnostic. I'll have to remember the word because it falls out my brain every time. Agnostic means they don't care about it. Um, but the, they, they have no sensitivity to black pepper. So if you can't smell black pepper in your syrup, don't worry. It might be there. It might not. You might not be able to smell it. Um, but French syrup in particular has this amazing black pepper um, smell to it a lot of the time. But let's pick out a couple of other things that are in there and see if you can smell them in your own. Obviously, I don't know what each of you has in the glass, but hopefully you can start to get mm, yes or mm, no. Um, but we've got lots of herbaceous and sometimes floral notes. So I've put violets in there. Some syrup can be quite aromatically violet. Um, if you're going for an Aussie one, you might have found that it's a bit more blueberry. And I've said Aussie really generally, um, but particularly if you're going for a more Barossa style, the classic Australian style uh, that most of us sort of uh, know and love. Uh, blueberry is really, really key. I've only included black fruits, but I should mention that you can get red fruits as well. It's not exclusively black, but normally you're gonna get more black than red. I've also included in there things like espresso. That can be a really interesting um, sort of, it sort of comes from the grape, it sort of comes from oak, um, some more unusual flavors as well. I've included plum sauce that you might have with your duck in there. I've got cloves, chocolate, vanilla, smoke, a bit of wood, all of those on that side of the screen, those sort of um, smoky chocolatey, they tend to come from oak. So I've grouped them together um, and in particular the affinity tends to be with smoke, mocha coffee, vanilla, those sorts of uh, aromas and flavours and then down at the bottom I've put some weird pictures so I must apologise they look a bit um, curious should we say. Um, those two strips are leather. It was really hard for me to find pictures of leather that made sense without putting a handbag on and making us all feel a bit weird about it. Um, so leather is definitely a smell that comes from aged syrup. Um, I put game, but actually lots of meat flavors. So even bacon can be quite a common smell or aroma in syrup. And then I've included some tobacco as well. It's got this sort of, can often have this sort of, um, yeah, not smoked tobacco, that fresh tobacco leaf smell. 
Um, and then last but not least, and I wanted to sort of um, include it separately and it's not on here. Um, well, it is actually, in, but you, it's not pulled out as big as I should have done. Um, but one thing you might get in the cooler climates is olives. Uh, black olives in particular, so it's hidden next to the cherry, uh, but also not only black olives, um, sometimes tapenade, uh, which is great when you're here in the Southern Rhone because olives and tapenade are plenty. Um, so I'm constantly smelling them and constantly reminding myself that that's the sort of aroma of Syrah. But if you do get opportunity to, to smell tapenade, please do, because it can be a really, really good indicator in wine. And in particular, anybody doing any WSET studies doing or blind tasting for fun, for me personally, that is the biggest indicator when something is a Syrah rather than a Cabernet Sauvignon. So they can be very similar. Um, we're doing Cabernet next week for anybody joining, um, but they're both high in acid, they're both high in tannins, lots of black fruits. Um, those tannins, remember the thing that's drying your mouth out, but the acid's making it water. They're usually full bodied, so lots going on. Um, but what I would say is the real indicator for me when one is uh, Syrah and the other isn't is that it's usually uh, this sort of olive tapenade type sensation that you just tend not to get with Cabernet. And Cabernet obviously does other things as well. So those are the uh, main sort of touch points, should I say, or the main uh, things you might recognize, but there are plenty of others in Syrah. It can be an incredibly complex uh, grape variety. So if you're smelling other things, pop them in the chat, let us know. Um, but it's uh, there's absolutely plenty to smell, but those are some of the key ones. So let's move on to where it's grown and then we'll start to cover off some of our wines. Um, it, it has its home in France, as I mentioned, and in particular in the Rhone Valley and its heartland, heartland is in the north. However, there are other parts of France that grow it too. So the Rhone is that lovely light pink section and the part we're gonna come back to in just a moment is the long strip, the Northern Rhone above the chunky pink bit beneath it. So we will come back to that in a moment. But before we go there, I would like to just mention a couple of other places that are quite important in uh, Syrah wine. One is the green section that was just on the, the side of your screen, which is Bordeaux, because before the Appalachian, oh, sorry, before the Appalachian system uh, was introduced, the Bordelais used to blend Syrah into their wines to um, make them sort of even more rich. Um, and you still find Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah blends uh, in parts of the New World, so the USA and Australia in particular. Uh, but you don't find them in Bordeaux anymore. Um, other parts are sort of more towards that Rhone area. So Minervois is one that you may have come across. Uh, there's some very, very famous and very good Syrah grown there. And it's worth mentioning the Languedoc as well. And it's really on the rise in the Languedoc in the south. Uh, and that's that light blue section all of that part there. They produce some really, really good wines. Uh, and in particular, if you do like uh, the, the Syrah of the Languedoc, then this uh, Pic Saint Loup vineyard area in particular is fantastic. So let's go to the Rhone because that is the heartland of our lovely Syrah. Um, the northern part of the Rhone produces Syrah as its only red grape variety. So whereas where I am now in the south has uh, Grenache is dominant and then Syrah often plays second fiddle, in the north Syrah rules the roots. So just why would we blend it in the south to give you a little bit of an idea before we go to the north? Um, Grenache is lovely, but it's, it can be very alcoholic and uh, if not treated correctly, uh, it can be quite sort of uh, or lacking in structure. Now, not true if you really look after your vines, but one thing that Syrah can do is it can bring the structure to Grenache. Um, there's also really complementary flavours because Grenache is more red fruit and Syrah is more black, so you end up with a more complex wine. Um, but it's definitely bringing things like tannins and body to the Southern Rhone blends. 
I would warn you that it's getting less favorable as temperatures increase, not because the quality is not as good, but because there are other varieties like Muveldra that love the heat a little more than Syrah does and are potentially dealing with the, the issues of climate change well. So Muveldra is nipping at the heels of Syrah. Uh, and if you've ever heard the expression GSM blend, Grenache Syrah Muveldra blend, you probably could argue now that the GSM blend those last two initials are potentially swapping. So Grenache will still rule the roost probably in the south, but the blends of the other varieties are changing slightly. However, Northern Rhone. So the Northern Rhone is, uh, as I mentioned, red variety Syrah. You can, however, blend some small portions of Viognier, a white grape, into some of the Appellation. And the most famous of those is Cote Roti. Although I would argue that in practice, that's not done quite as commonly as you might think. Uh, so although they're allowed to do it, you're probably more likely to just find that the Cote Roti wines are 100% Syrah as well. Uh, but the two most famous Appalachian, and I think we've got a little Northern Rome map we can pop up because it is where wine number one is from. Uh, but the two most famous Appalachian are Hermitage, and co-roti. And just here, this is again a big picture of the Rhone Valley. Hermitage is the tiny little green bit right in the middle. Uh, it's sort of one of them, well, it's greeny yellow, I tell a lie. Uh, it's the more it's more southerly, and coat roti is right towards the top there where the river bends. And it literally means roasted slope. Uh, whereas Hermitage is a hill, so the hill of Hermitage. And there's a better picture for you right there. So we've got Coat Roti at number one, where the river's bent over, and Creuse Hermitage and Hermitage. And I will make the distinct difference in a moment, but number five, Hermitage being the hill there. So those are the two most famous. They're the ones you may have heard about. They are certainly the most expensive. Uh, very, very good structured wines. Uh, in terms of the difference between the two, Coat Roti is usually a little more perfumed. Um, again, they can blend Viognier in there, but either way, it usually is more perfumed anyway. And in terms of value, Croix Hermitage, which is sort of the larger appellation that runs around the hill of Hermitage, it's not quite the same soil. Um, so it's not quite the same schist um, that is, is, makes this area so famous, but there is some in there. And in terms of value, most people tend to think that the best value wines in the Northern Row are the Creuse Hermitage, so running around the hill of Hermitage. So uh, why are they so good? Well, they are on ridiculously steep slopes um, and there are some bonuses to that. There is some soil erosion. Um, there are, it's incredibly hard to work, which is why the vines are, are, are um, trellised slightly differently. So they look like little Christmas trees because uh, the, the land is basically sliding. And it's there's sometimes you have to use pulley systems to get your grapes up the vineyard. Uh, there's a reason I'm not doing the harvest in the Northern Rhone. And that's because it's apparently one of the hardest, if not the hardest harvest on the planet. Um, if you've ever driven the drive, the slopes are incredible. Um, but Cote Roti, the one you saw at the top, what that means is even though it's northerly, it literally is a roasted slope. It gets this incredible sunshine. Uh, so they're really special pockets. And as I mentioned, with this amazing schist soil. So let's have a taste of one. Now, I wanted to keep this affordable, so I didn't want to throw in a, uh, a uh, hermitage. Uh, as, well, I did want to, that was, we'll do that another time. Uh, but those Cru Appalachian are expensive. And we're talking about uh, the likes of Jabalé, who you might have heard of, Chave, um, probably 150 pounds a bottle if we wanted to, uh, if we wanted to really indulge. But what we've actually got here in our society's French Syrah is, and I apologize, I really hate showing labels on, on Zooms, um, but Tim has a picture as well. But um, this is a really, really good introduction to the style. Now it's very affordable, it's 7.95, um, but it's made by a boutique uh, negociant called Nicolas Perrin. 
and you may recognize the name, uh, Perren. Uh, so Nicola is actually from the Jaboulet family of the North. And the parents, for anyone who uh, is going, oh, hello, they are from the south, in particularly Chateauneuf de Pape, where they make Chateau de Beaucastel. And um, th this is a sort of coming together of the two families. Um, and this, they've produced this negociant that buys in grapes. These particular grapes are from uh, both the left and right bank of the river coming down, but they're not an Appalachian wine. And then they are from a small micro region called Brezem. And I have to apologize because I know I've pronounced that poorly, um, but it's a tiny, tiny little appellation, but it's just south of Croisemetage. So it's just south of that pocket of really good value that I mentioned. Um, this is unoaked. Uh, so it's sort of a pure expression of Syrah. And for me, it's really great. Whether you've got the 2019 or the 2020, you should in theory get very similar fruit laden, but spicy, peppery. Um, there's a lovely sort of, uh, I don't know whether anybody's ever, ever done pepper on strawberries, that lovely combination, but it's a great uh, pairing of those two those two different things, that sweetness and that savouriness. So let me know what you're thinking on the nose. In terms of the palate, and you'll have to excuse me, just reaching over for my makeshift spittoon. It's got those lovely tannins that you expect to get from Syrah, but it's not too intense. It's definitely a lighter style. Um, but great savouriness. And here I'm getting that slightly more olivey thing. Tapenade, drying tannins, some fruit, but definitely a black pepper finish, which is great. A really good example of an unoaked French traditional style syrup. So I'm really glad Marcel has, has um, chosen to go with these guys for this wine. They also make our exhibition Croisemetage, or they source our exhibition Croisemetage. Uh, so I think Marcel's really onto a good thing with this particular region and understanding these wines. So yeah, please do let me know what you think. Um, in terms of other parts of Europe, um, Spain is a really good place for Syrah. So if you like Priorat, that's a very popular area for Syrah. Um, and then it's it's one of the blending partners, I should say. So it's, it wouldn't be 100% Syrah. Grenache is actually still the, the main grape variety there. And yes, you get this sort of um, added weight with the Syrah. So they call it Garnacha Tinta, the red, red uh, Grenache there. Um, but they definitely include things like Cabernet and Syrah as well. So if you're having a pre wrap it may well be in there. Um, likewise in Italy, Tuscany, the Super Tuscans, they love a little bit of Syrah in their blends. Um, so again, a sort of French transportation into a, into a blend in some very, very expensive and famous parts of the wine world. Uh, in terms of the new world, before we go on to our little South African number, I'll run through the other options other than SA and Australia. Um, USA, it is popular, but I would argue it probably lives a little bit in the shadow of Cabernet Sauvignon around most parts of of the USA, but there are a lot of people making more Rhone styles, which is fab. New Zealand, Hawke's Bay, Gimlet Gravels, very popular. And again, slightly cooler climate, so more Rhone there as well. Um, Argentina, it's only actually about 10% of the plantings uh, in Argentina, but really popular. Obviously they've got Malbec, that's great for their big reds, um, but the Ciro is maybe sort of on the up, should we say. And then Chile, so in Chile, places like Cochagua and Maipo, they're producing some really lovely and incredibly good value Syrahs as well. It's worth sort of saying that Syrah, because it's more on the, I'd say on the up in the global world, world stage, you definitely can find some really good bargains for the quality of the wine. So on that note, let's go to South Africa. Um, so Syrah as a variety has actually been in South Africa for a really long time. Um, in the 1880s, uh, there was a, um, a viticulturist, but viticulturalist uh, called Baron Carl von Bobo. And there was a winery that now doesn't exist. It's been split into two called Group Constantia. Uh, well, yeah, the client is, 
it changed hands slightly, but it's considered the original winery of South Africa. And he promoted, he imported and then promoted uh, Syrah to in that particular winery. The cuttings were actually from Australia. So they call it Shiraz as opposed to Syrah. Um, and we'll go on to that whole, uh, oh, I've just seen Benjamin Dawson's written, do, do you think Shiraz cheapens Syrah? I'm going to go on to it when we get to Australia, but Shiraz um, is, is what they tend to call it in South Africa because uh, those clippings and cuttings were from Australia where they called it Shiraz. Um, in 1957, the first 100% varietal wine from Syrah slash Syrah, Shiraz, was produced in South Africa. Um, and then in 1994, they made uh, one, a producer whose name escapes me, made the first wine labeled Syrah as opposed to Shiraz. So that well, didn't happen until 1994. Um, let's go into the discussion on the name when we get to Australia, but do bear that in mind. It was producing wines under the label Shiraz for a very long time and then somebody made an active decision to say Syrah, not Shiraz. Um, in general, it's very hard to generalize about South African Shiraz, um, but there are three key regions that produce it. Uh, Stellenbosch, Paul, and Robert Robertson. Uh, Stellenbosch and Paul tend to be the warmer ones, and you can see from the map there, yeah, right by the, sorry, tend to be the cooler ones, right by the coast, they're getting some Cape Doctor influence, that lovely sea breeze. Uh, they tend to make slightly more Rome styles, but um, again, I'd really rather not generalize. Um, Robertson is hotter, and therefore you're getting much more sort of tradition, what we'd call a tradition Aussie style, although I'm going to say why that's a bit damaging and not a good, not a good thing to say. And we'll argue about what a traditional Australian Shiraz is shortly. Um, but yeah, so we've, Tim's very kindly pointed out the spots on the map for you there, um, but it can be really hard to generalise and there isn't really a, a one size fits all uh, in the Shiraz Syrah world. Um, what I would say is just read the label, find out where it's from. If it looks like it's from a coastal part, um, then it's, chances are it's going to be a little bit cooler and those fruits might be sort of uh, a bit tartar, maybe a bit less blueberry. Um, and then also how it's made is really, really important. So on that note, I'm going to go into talking about this particular wine. Um, now, it's a wine of origin and it's Western Cape, which means it's a blend of a few of the regions. So it hasn't got a WO origin of just, uh, you know, Stellenbosch, for example. Um, it's produced by Boutonou. And I'm, as I mentioned, they're kindly letting me use their, their base in the Rhone this evening for this event. Uh, but I've actually visited as well their, their HQ in South Africa and it's fab. Company is, uh, it was started by a gentleman called Paul Boutonou in the 1980s. Um, and the, uh, they've got vineyards in the Rhone. They've got vineyards in Italy, which are actually on this picture behind me, and then in South Africa as well. But South Africa was actually where they started. So uh, it was certainly where they set up base early on. Um, and this particular wine, I think, is a roaring success. I'm so uh, glad that Joe purchases this. It's from mainly the Spartland Mountains. So it is a blend, but the majority is from the Spartland Mountains, which are sandstone and alluvial soils. And Sarah loves that alluvial soil. It is hot and dry here. Now, it forces that, that dryness and that heat forces the vines to work really hard. What that does is the yields are quite low. So what the grape actually produces and therefore actually the berries can be swipe quite small. And because the berries are small, there's less juicy bit in the middle and more skins. Um, and because of that, it, it can be a little more tannic. So it will be a more structured wine. However, uh, this wine has seen a little bit of oak and that oak is gonna polymerize those tannins beautifully. So we should be getting more tannin or certainly um, obvious tannins, but they'll be lovely and smooth. Um, yeah, give it a smell, give it a taste. Um, in terms of the oak, if anybody wants to know, I haven't spotted anyone else, but I'll tell you. Uh, it's French oak barriques that they're using here. And they also do something quite interesting, which is they blend 15% of last of a previous vintage, which you're not allowed to do in the European Union, but you can do that, I think. 
I don't think you can in the EU, but you can do in South Africa. Um, so, oh yeah, it's it's definitely aromatic. I actually do get some more red fruit in this one, and I did mention earlier there is sometimes some, but I'm definitely getting a little bit more uh, red, and I'm getting a sort of a bit herbaceous, maybe a bit of licorice. We didn't really talk about licorice earlier, but there can be some licorice on Syrah and I'm getting a bit of that. It definitely smells a bit warmer. The fruit is quite ripe. Oh yeah. See, there is definitely more red and black fruit here for me. And the other thing is it is peppery, but I didn't think it's as spicy as the the wine before, but it has got this aromatic lifted note. And I often get that from things like licorice or more accurately, licorice root. My father used to take us to a particular market and always used to chew, we used to chew um, on sticks of licorice rather than the sweet. And uh, that's definitely the sensation that I'm getting. So that was nice. Um, but yeah, lovely herbal lifted, like I said. Um, I do think those tannins really softened. Um, it's got a bit of a boozy kick to it. It's 14.5%, but it's really nicely integrated. It doesn't feel too much. It almost feels like this is actually a Syrah that's bought. It says Shiraz, but it feels like a Syrah made in a Southern Rhone style, I'd say. Um, so I'm not surprised that this particular producer who has a base here in Southern Rhone and a base in, uh, well, several bases in South Africa is producing a wine a little bit like this. So, um, please let me know what you think. I think that's an absolutely stonking wine for the price again. Um, yeah, lovely. Um, I'll mention one thing and I, I'll be quick and I won't go into it any more than this now because I'm going to do a sip size on it next year for sure. But you might notice if you've got all three poured that there's slightly less color in this one. And then you might say to me, Anna, you just said that there was going to be more colour because the berries were really small. They have, they have put some of this wine, fermented, uh, they fermented some of this wine on the stems. And stem inclusion is something that you can do with Syrah. We could talk for hours about stem inclusion, so we won't now. Uh, but one thing that including stems sometimes does is it takes, it leaches some of the colour. And I think that's happened here. I actually hadn't noticed it before, but now I've got proper light on it. I definitely think the stems have leached some of the colour. So if it does look a bit paler to you, fear not. Your wine has not been watered down. Uh, it's, been, it's been fermented on the stems. And we will talk about that uh, on another sip size. So fear not. Right, let's go to Australia because let's be honest, other than France, Australia is, it rules the roost on, in the world of Syrah and Shiraz. It didn't, it was about 50 years earlier than South Africa uh, in terms of getting its plantings. And uh, a Scotsman called James Busby brought clippings. He actually is considered sort of godfather of Australian wine and quite rightly so. He uh, went back to Europe and gathered some cuttings of vines and uh, mainly around France, but a little bit in Italy as well. And one of the vines that he brought back was Syrah. Um, the reason there has been a bit of a misnomer, people think, is that on the ledgers, there were a couple of spellings of the grape Syrah. And one of them was S-C-Y-R-A-S. -S, and one was C-I-R-A-S. Um, my dyslexia is getting better on me there. Um, but there were two spellings, neither of which sort of have a Z or a Shiraz in them, but certainly both end in S. And I think over time, language just changed. And unfortunately, people, well, I say, I was about to say, unfortunately, we're about to talk about it now, Syrah versus Shiraz. Uh, but people have defaulted or people, language change over a long time meant that it ended up as Shiraz. Anyway, planted in a botanical garden in Sydney. And then eight years later, uh, once they'd grown in the botanical gardens, they took those cuttings down to Southern Australia and started planting them. Um, that does mean, before we go on to Shiraz, 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 Syrah, that Barossa, because it's had no phylloxera, might genuinely have Syrah vines that date back to 1843. So it's believed to have the oldest vines in the world because it 
hasn't been ravaged by phylloxera and those uh, cirrhi vines there are legendary. So we've got a map of where that is here, um, but you're kind of in Syrra heartland. Um, but just a quick chat on the Syrra Shiraz debate. Um, somebody mentioned or asked, do you think it cheapens Syrra? Um, I don't think it cheapens it. I think we've had, um, there is, when a producer now actively makes a choice to write Syrah or Shiraz on the label, they're now making a stylistic note. So if you're writing Shiraz, what you tend to mean is the classic Australian style of the grape variety. And I'll tell you a bit about what that looks like in a second. If you're choosing to write Syrah and lots of producers do, it's becoming, it's becoming more commonplace for new world producers to use Syrah. Then that means you're making your wine in quite a French style. And that will tend to be the more refined, a little bit austere at times, particularly if it's underripe, you're gonna get more of those olive, flavors I mentioned, black pepper, et cetera. But I do think um, the lines are blurred and I certainly don't think Shiraz cheapens Syrah now, um, but I do think if you're seeing one of those two terms on the bottle, it is giving you an indication about what to expect in the glass. Um, I think in the olden days, there may have been a, a, a sense that it cheapened um, because it wasn't French. It was not French and therefore possibly cheapened. So. For me, not anymore, but certainly when, when Australian Shiraz was flooding the market, some at great quality, some at very poor quality, it must be said. When that happened, of course, there was a bit of an identity crisis. Certainly people moved thinking Shiraz was cheaper and actually uh, it doesn't have to be the case because arguably the most expensive Syrah Shiraz in the world is Penfold's Grange. So um, if you've got a sort of 400, 500 pound budget to buy some Grange, then you're not thinking that Shiraz, Aussie Shiraz is a cheap wine. So uh, think of it more stylistically, it's personal preference. Um, but what they used to be, uh, Aussie Shiraz, um, in particular the cheaper end, not so much the fancy end, uh, but they did used to be big and jammy. Um, so they were sort of blue fruits, they were far more uh, alcoholic, they would have seen some more new oak. And then if we're talking new oak, we're going back to those flavors clusters at the top. So things like vanilla, chocolate. Now, what I would say is lots of people have a sweet tooth, but don't know it or admit it. And a lot of old Aussie Shiraz also had a tiny bit of residual sugar in it. In a way you might think, oh no, sweet wine. So many people like a bit of residual sugar in their red wine, then they either realize or let on. So there was a market for it um, and there was a market for affordable Australian Shiraz. Um, but I think now the sort of pendulum has swung back and the market is, is coming back to slightly more um, somewhere in the middle, let's say, somewhere in the European Australian mid ground. Um, but if it's worth saying now, I mentioned it earlier, do not generalize and say one Aussie Shiraz tastes like another. I'll run through a couple of the regions quickly and say what sorts of styles to get, but I'm actually not gonna dwell on it too much because I'm gonna encourage you to watch that Emma Symington uh, webinar from last week, which was so enlightening for me. I learned so much. So I'll push you towards that, but just to give you a bit of an overview, um, Barossa, which tends to be the most well-known, it's the historic one, as I've mentioned, they tend to be full-bodied, quite rich, pepper and black fruits. They are often oaked in their style. So we've got the Barossa up there. I've already been told off by Tim today for my generalizing of uh, Australia. He said, do you know that between Barossa and McLaren Vale, nearly a four hour drive? Yeah. Apparently I was grouping them together too much. So that's a true Australian for me there. They look so close together on the map. You forget that, that that region there is probably the size of Europe. <laughs> but McLaren Vale, very different climate, Mediterranean, blueberries, more fruit, sort of fruit focused. Um, Heathcote, um, again, I've pronounced that poorly. Sorry, Tim, I don't want to put on my Aussie accent for you. Um, a lot of people say there's some sort of irony, iron like minerality to those wines. Hunter Valley, which is all the way up by Northern Sydney, you wouldn't think it grows here, um, but it does. And it's very savoury. There we go. Good old, good old Australian Tim getting all of the locations spot on. You'd 
I hope so, wouldn't you? Um, and then Clare Valley, I wanted to mention because um, you would never think that Syrah would grow anywhere that Riesling grows after I banged on last week about how it needs such a cold climate. Um, however, it does grow in Clare Valley and it grows beautifully with those licorice flavours. So a huge range of diversity in Australia. So saying Australian Shiraz is like saying, I don't know, it, you can't really do it. American, well, no, it's even worse than anything I could imagine. I was about to say American Chardonnay, you can make some more generalizations, but Aussie Shiraz should not be generalized the way it is. Um, as soon as we go down to the cooler sites in Victoria as well, like my, Mount Langley, they go towards Northern Rhone in the style. So yes, it's too diverse to generalize. So in the last couple of minutes, before I try and do some quick fire questions, let's talk about this wine. Um, so the uh, Bleasdale Vineyards were founded in the 1850s by a gentleman called Frank Potts, um, and he arrived in Australia from Portsmouth. So lots of uh, Scottish and English influence um, in the Australian wines. He saw the potential of these alluvial soils. We've mentioned that Sarah already likes those. And also uh, the river, so Bremer View, it's, so the Bremer River, um, upon which this area is sort of centralized, that actually uh, floods the plains. So even though it's incredibly hot uh, here in the Langhorn Creek region, it depends on that flood irrigation for its water. Um, to give you an idea of where it was on the map, it was just south of Barossa and Egypt. I say just south, again, Tim's says I'm, that's not just south, that's not true. On the visual, it looks like just south. In a car, not so much. <laughs> but it is south of Barossa and Eden, and then it's just to the east of McLaren Vale. So um, it's in that southern section, uh, well, it's called South, south Australia, uh, where all the big boys live. Um, thank you, Tim, for the good pointing out there. <laughs> so it's right up in there, but it's a, certainly a lesser known region. Um, and until the 1990s, a lot of the fruit from here was just blended into a multi-regional sort of South Australian blend. Um, but then, then a few growers got together, including Bleasdale, and they said, hey, actually, this is, this is a really good area. So they now label their wines and they are promoting 100% Langhorne Creek wines, which is fabulous, being recognised in its own right. Um, for me, Freddie has actually done another great, uh, simple, but really, really spot on tasting note on this. This is the first Shiraz Syrah of the evening for me that's blueberries, blue fruits rather than black. Um, and we have had 12 months in oak and 15% of that oak was new. So of course we've got vanilla and um, I actually think maybe something a bit like cloves as well. Um, so it's definitely got that kind of sweet, um, I, don't, I don't want to say summer pudding because I don't think that, yeah, I don't think that's a um, good enough analysis, but it's certainly got sweet fruits, sweet baking spices, um, but it's dry. So we're not getting RS, not getting residual sugar in this. So give it a taste. So if you smelt it and thought it was gonna be sweet, no, no. Beautiful kind of um, luscious tannins, plummy rich fruits but not sugary fruits so they're much more sort of it's just like an unctuous um fruity feeling and it's really really mouthfeel um luscious and smooth and oh yeah 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 a treat um if i got vanilla on the nose i think i'm getting more chocolate on the palate but maybe a bit of coffee as well or like bitter chocolate um i would go with a with a bit of dark chocolate with that one i think that would be absolutely gorgeous um, so yes, that was a whistle stop tour of Syrah. Um, I've finished with one minute to spare, so I'll wrap up with a couple of questions. One minute was maybe hopeful, but there we go. Um, <laughs> Benjamin's asked out of the three countries, oh, three countries, which would be your desert island Syrah. Um, countries is hard, because if you're asking me to pick a country to only buy Syrah or Shiraz from for the rest of my life, I'd probably actually go with South Africa. And sorry, Tim, and sorry, um, my French colleagues. Um, but I think we've got a lot more left to see on um, what South Africa can do with Syrah. So if I wanted to sort of be surprised and delighted for the, for the 
the rest of my desert island. If they were just shipping me new versions, then it would be South Africa. Um, and if it were between these three, I think I'd probably go for the French. I think um, you wouldn't necessarily chill the French, but I think the French would probably drink best in the warm climate of the, uh, <laughs> in the warmer climate of my island. I don't know why I'm going to a warm island, I've assumed. Um, and so I think it would probably probably be the most versatile. Uh, so yes, that's, that's uh, why I'd pick that. But to be honest, Syrah would be a great desert island wine anyway, because there's so much going on. There's, um, it's complex, but it's still charming and delightful. And one of the reasons I really love Syrah as a grape variety is um, the world, I don't personally think, has woken up to how amazing it is. And so you can still buy really, really top, top draw wines. And I've seen a few people drinking some, some lovely wines. Steve's got a Saint Joseph 2016 that he got on Primer. You can, you can buy some really, really good value wines for much, um, you know, a fraction of the price of some of the other wines in the world. So I certainly think, um, yeah, it, there's a lot more to go on Syrah around the world, but also you can really try lots of different styles and you don't have to spend more than 15 pounds to really explore the beauty of Syrah as a great variety. Um, yeah, and I'm glad people are drinking Chilean versions, they're drinking American versions, I can see. So fantastic. Yeah, it really does have a um, have scope. I'll finish on one last question, um, which is uh, enjoying the French Syrah, great value. I've usually found Saint Joseph underwhelming compared to Crozet Hermitage and Cote Roti. Is there any difference in the way it's made? Um, plenty, although I would probably pick producers rather than um, regions if you're going. Uh, well, the problem is Croix Hermitage, I think we're all pretty agreed is the best value. I wouldn't say I find um, San Joseph underwhelming, but it, it's certainly not um, probably as well thought of as you also mentioned Coat Roti. So I would probably say uh, just pick producers. Um, and in particular, I would uh, uh, try producers that make lots of different wines in different parts. So people like Jabalay would be a really good place to explore. Um, Cause yeah, in terms of how they're actually made, it, it would vary producer by producer. I mentioned stem inclusion earlier. All you have to do is include stems and syrup and you've completely changed the way the wine's made. So uh, yeah, it, it does all sorts of things. It changes the acids, it changes the color, it changes the tannins. So definitely go producer by producer if you're a nuanced syrup drinker rather than by region, cause you might find a bit more going on there. Um, I, oh, I do have a couple more questions and I'll quickly fire through them as quickly as possible. Um, uh, I've heard a bit recently from Beth about Syrah Rome blends and Paso Rome blends in California being very up and coming, made in a very cool climate style. Any thoughts on these and does the society stock any? Um, I went to Paso a few years ago, tasted loads and loads of Syrah and in particular Rome blends. Um, they are being made in a cool climate style. Uh, we do sometimes stock uh, oh, the name escapes me. Uh, Tablas Creek, so the Boca Stel, it's just over from Paso. Um, they tend to be blends though, rather than Syrah, um, but there are some really good wines coming out of the Paso area. The only thing I'd say is they actually are on the more expensive side. So um, yes, please do, but I would say it's not the cheapest. Um, to prime example, Mahesh has just sent me a uh, one that we have in stock at the moment. Uh, the Pedro Sasse Santa Inez Valley Sebastiano Vineyard Syrah 2015, and that is £28 a bottle. So you are going to pay a bit more for a Californian Syrah, particularly a, a Cali Syrah from a really good place like Paso, which is really up and coming. So um, <coughs> just be aware that those are um, more on the expensive side, Beth, but you're definitely going to get some good quality there. And then I'll just finish on one final question, which is from David Buchanan saying, can you give us a brief explanation on the concept of structure when it comes to Syrah? Um, so structure can mean, uh, I'm talking about structure in a sort of educational WSET manner. Um, so I'm really talking about how the wine feels in your mouth. Um, and for me, um, Syrah just has a very, very particular structure, but I would suggest breaking it down into the building blocks or the components. 
um, and WSET does a really good job of those. Um, acidity, so is it low, medium or high? This has high acid, so your mouth is watering. Um, tannins, again, they sort of talk about it on a scale and then talk about the type of tannins. Um, tannins, that thing that dries your mouth and your lips and your teeth out. Um, again, Shiraz has high tannins, but the nature of those tannins can often be quite fine grained. So they can be really chalky. Um, and it's often you change the structure when you do something like oak it and you change the structure of those tannins. So I would say chalky fine grain tannins for me tends to be how I experience syrup. And then that plus alcohol tends to contribute to the body. So how does it feel in your mouth? Um, and that can be quite subjective. It can actually be quite hard to explain that. Um, but for me, syrup is, has got this really lovely mouth filling sensation. One of the reasons that I would say Syrah has not had the success per se that Cabernet has is a lot of people tend to think that the structure of Cabernet is almost unbeatable and it's got this kind of lusciousness that it's, it's um, oh, people talk about mid palate and filling the donut in your mouth and all this sort of stuff. And uh, I, I wouldn't go too deep into that technical detail, but how does it feel in your mouth? Does it fill your mouth? Um, do, do you kind of get a sensation of richness, of lusciousness. So all of those things go into the concept of structure. Right, sorry, that really was a whistle stop and I've overrun a game. Gosh, I think I'm gonna to have to start just calling it 50 minutes, but I hope you don't mind. I'd like to finish on a few questions at the end. Um, thank you all members for joining me this evening and thank you for uh, putting up with um, a slight change of scene as well. Um, thank you for that. Thanks for Tim and Mahesh behind the scenes um, and for the lovely people at Bridgenew for letting me borrow your kitchen area for, for the evening. Um, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that my internet will be fixed next week. We're going to go on to Cabernet Sauvignon. So all of those comparisons that I've been making this evening, it's the prime example to go on to Cabernet and we can talk about why that's different. Uh, of course, if you want to, you're welcome to get a bottle of Syrah if you do want to compare and contrast, but I would suggest getting hold of the three cabinets that we've chosen for next week. One of which is slightly more expensive, but there's a reason because I do want to, uh, to talk about Cabernet and Bordeaux, as you'd expect. Thanks again for coming though. Um, also on the Bordeaux point, one final thing from me, if you're signing up to our, or have signed up to our Loire and Bordeaux sip sizes in November, those wines are now on the website and I apologize for the delay, but they're up, they're ready and uh, fill your boots. So I'll send an email around as per usual with all the stuff I whistled through. Uh, but as for uh, that, I will see you all next week, I hope. Thank you and cheers.